I love this argument so much. Can I prove that something supernatural doesn't exist? Something I can't detect with any of my five primary senses, or any other sense for that matter. Something that has been undetectable by science for centuries. You want me to disprove? Sure, but first I have a question for you. Can you disprove every other religion and deity in history in favor of your god? The Greeks, the Roman, the Norse, the Slavic, the Celtic pantheons, all of them. What about the flying spaghetti monster? Can you disprove him? See, I can make a dozen arguments on how Christianity just doesn't make sense in a realistic viewpoint. But I bet you can't make an argument without using the Bible that the Christian God exists. We live in a natural world, and making a supernatural claim is the one that requires proof. Atheism is more logical than theism. So, like, first of all, this guy says that he's happy, he's sure, like, that he's going to present these reasons that show that God doesn't exist, or at least our God doesn't exist. And he never does that in the video, but, I mean, that, but then he asks the question back to us. I think to make the point that you wouldn't accept this as a challenge, or you wouldn't be able to rise to the occasion of disproving all other religions. Well, here's first of all the thing that, that, that I want to say. I'd love to hear your reasons that disprove God. Um, but then the other side of this is when you're talking about these other gods, we don't, first of all, we don't have to disprove these other gods. Christian apologists say this all the time. Um, in general, I don't have a problem with the notion that something supernatural is going on. The question is, what is the nature of that supernatural thing? So are these religions false? I believe that the message uh, about the nature of reality and God and all those things are false in those other religions. Yes, I believe that. But I don't necessarily believe there's nothing supernatural going on or, you know, that that some of the things that they may have claimed have happened in the history of their religion didn't happen. Or even in some cases, claims they make about God turn out to be true. I've, I've said that many times. But but so so we actually can make sense of that. So then there's this other uh, question about can I shoot down those other religions without using the Bible? Well, some of them, yes, because you can just use. Um, certain philosophical arguments or ideas or arguments about the nature of God that I think do call away some of these other religions, many of these other religions. That's certainly true. Are there some that those philosophical arguments don't necessarily work for? Yeah, I think so. Um, now, here, what do, we, what do we do in a case like that? Well, what we do in a case like that is we look at, say, something like um, Islam, and we say, okay, look, if we look at uh, what the Bible says about Jesus and what Jesus said about himself— now, you say, well, we can't use the Bible. I find that so strange. If you're going to look at a his, like the historical, if you're going to make a historical case or look at historical evidence related to Christianity, which is the way you're going to get information about Christianity um, in terms of non-spiritual ways, is you're going to look at information that has been passed down, historical information and things like that. Well, the primary sources for the growth of Christian or the, for the life of Jesus and the growth of the early church are going to be biblical books. So you don't just throw those out, and neither does Bart Ehrman or the Jesus Seminar or anybody else that's that's antagonistic toward Christianity. What they're going to do is they're they're going to look at it, and they're just not going to presume that it's like from God or anything. They're just going to look, what can we tell from this? And so you get information like that that even even people like the Jesus Seminar. Uh, agree, in their book, like the five gospels will, will agree. Okay. This at least is historical. So you can use those. I mean, it'd be really strange. Like anyone who's ever worked on a, a dissertation, that's anything like this, even if it's secular and has to do with historical documents and things like that, you're going to want to get to the, the primary sources or as early close to them as you possibly can, because that's what you're going to want to, if you don't do that, you're just not doing it right. So you're asking us frankly to do bad research when you say, don't use the Bible to make the points that you want to make or to make historical points like this. So, yeah, we can use the Bible, but then when we use the Bible, you know, people that make, say, a minimal, people that make a maximal facts case, like Lydia Gru or my friend Eric Manning um, and people like that, when they make a maximal facts case, they're still going to give you the reasons why they think you can take these things to be historical and reasonable to accept. Um, and when it comes to people making a minimal facts case, the most popular case for the resurrection that is made often, uh, some form of a minimal facts case, um, you're, you're, you're only using often the material that the non-Christian scholars in the field are willing to grant that you should be able to use. Like, uh, even though they may not claim that you can grant the supernatural things that are said to have happened, 
that are recorded in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 7. You can say about 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 7, which says that this is the gospel I preached when I was with you. Jesus was dead, buried, rose again according to the scriptures, then he appeared to all these people, right? They'll at least agree that that is a historical creed. That's a historical item that goes very far back. So we should be able to use these things. When we use that to build a case for the resurrection of Jesus, that is the central historical claim of the Christian faith. And then we believe that Jesus says, we, we think we can argue that Jesus said, is, it's reasonable to think Jesus said these things like um, that were exclusive about the Christian faith, that he was the only way. Well, if I believe that God exists, and I believe I have good reason to believe that the resurrection is true and, and that that vindicates the claims of Jesus and Christianity is an exclusive exclusive religion. Well, I can't take a move like maybe some Hindus would do and take Jesus and throw him into like one of the bhakti cults as his own, as a God that we worship, but he's not the only one or something like that. I can't do that because, um, I, not with a straight face anyway, because Christianity over here, I have good reason to believe that it's true and it's exclusive, right? But then on top of that, there are historical problems with, uh, the claims of other religions and philosophical problems and, and those kind of things too. So yeah, we look at all those things in our Wyma series. We have like most of the major world religions, if not all of them are covered there in that old series from several years ago. And so we do look at those, but yeah, I mean, I think there are several problems here. One is the claim that, well, science hasn't proven this God. We got to get off this train of thinking science is the only way to come to know things. It's simply not. So I think there is scientific evidence, but we got to get off this idea that science is just the be all end all, the only way to come to know things. I'm not saying this person affirms scientism, but that's a, that, that is a comment that sounds friendly to scientism. And the truth is we can come to know things other ways. The second thing is you're not allowed to use the Bible. Um, when that strikes against good research, it's just we have to responsibly use it when we're trying to develop historical claims. And, uh, and, and then, uh, yeah, lastly, he says this, how do, you, how do you rule out this flying spaghetti monster and things like that? The notion here is we could apply some of the attributes that Christians apply to God and then get to and then show that, for all you know, the spying, flying spaghetti monster or something exists. Now, the flying spaghetti monster has all kinds of its own problems because, at least as we understand these terms, spaghetti is a physical thing. And oftentimes what the atheist will do is they'll say something like, well, it's a metaphysical, supernatural spaghetti. And they're trying to make it work. But let's just do it this way. Let's let's go with what Matt Dillahunty often said. How do you know it's not universe creating pixies that are responsible? They're spaceless, timeless, non-material, incredibly powerful, wise, universe creating pixies and not God. The truth is that universe creating pixies. OK, so how many do you need? You're, you're acting like there's more than one. Well, Occam's razor would call away all the variables unnecessary for explanation. And so you've got this uh, one universe creating pixie, but it's a spaceless, timeless, non-material, sufficiently powerful, exceedingly wise universe creating pixie. That's just theism. You're just describing God and calling God a pixie. So welcome to theism, you pixie theist, or you flying spaghetti monster theist, or whatever else, because when you start pointing to, well, I can just point to the theistic arguments and I can supplant whatever I want to make up and it'll fit. And then I've got the same evidence that for, for this, you have something. And it's like, no, that's not at all what's going on because all you end up doing is funneling down through the theistic arguments to God and then putting a different label. It just ends up describing the theism I already affirm and just labeling it something else. So 